Welcome back to another episode of Practical Stoicism. I am your host, Tanner Campbell. A big thank you for all the new reviews on Apple Podcasts and Spotify Podcasts. I think there are nearly 120 of them now. And frankly, that's incredible. Thank you. I genuinely do appreciate you taking the time to leave those. They mean a lot to me. And they help to keep me feeling like the work we're doing here is something important, something that people want more of. Today, we're going to be exploring Meditation 13 from Book 2 of Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, which reads as follows. Nothing is more pathetic than people who run around in circles, delving into the things that lie beneath and conducting investigations into the souls of the people around them, never realizing that all you have to do is be attentive to the power inside you and worship it sincerely. To worship it is to keep it from being muddied with turmoil and becoming aimless and dissatisfied with nature, divine and human. What is divine deserves our respect because it is good. What is human deserves our affection because it is like us, and our pity too, sometimes, for its inability to tell good from bad, as terrible a blindness as the kind that can't tell white from black. This meditation is interesting to me because of the last line, but let's take it from the beginning. Nothing is more pathetic than people who run around in circles, delving into the things that lie beneath, and conducting investigations into the souls of the people around them. Pathetic here is sometimes translated as wretched, but either way, I think we all know what Marcus is talking about here because we all claim disdain for the same thing when we see it. He's talking about people who busy themselves with gossip, or when they are constantly judging and speaking poorly about others, or when they can find all the criticism in the world for others, but are entirely blind to their own shortcomings, focusing always on someone else and never on themselves. No one I can think of particularly likes people like this today in modernity, and it would seem no one liked people like that in ancient Rome either. After all, what value is this sort of person bringing to any equation? Is it not always negative and distracting? Never realizing that all you have to do is be attentive to the power inside you and worship it sincerely. Now here, the power is more accurately translated, I think, as daemon, D-A-E-M-O-N. For Marcus and for other Stoics as well, your inner daemon was a spark of the divine, synonymous with the Logos. Here's the Greek philosopher Heraclitus, who lived from 540 to 480 BCE. If you've never heard someone say BCE, and I hope I am not being condescending here, I know that the first time I saw BCE, I wondered if it was different than BC. It is. I'm not exactly clear on how it is different, but BCE stands for Before the Common Era generally, I think, accepted to be zero, but you might want to do your own research on that. However, (laughs) either way, Heraclitus lived a long time ago, and he lived before about a hundred or so years, a hundred or more years, before the founding of traditional Stoicism. Although this logos is eternally valid, men are unable to understand it, not only before hearing it, but even after they have heard it for the first time. That is to say, although all things come to pass in accordance with this Logos, men seem to be quite without any experience of it, at least if they are judged in the light of such words and deeds as I am here setting forth. Now this is at the beginning of a series of texts that I believe are referred to as the fragments of Heraclitus. According to Wikipedia, he wrote a single work of which only fragments exist. So very literally, the fragments of Heraclitus refer to fragments of his entire body of work. And it's probably important to say that Heraclitus was an influential thinker of his time. And if you can't tell from that single passage, he had a significant impact on the thoughts of Stoic philosophers and of the thoughts of those who founded the Stoic philosophy of Zeno of Sitium, for example, and those who advanced it after that. And this is the case even though, as I said earlier, he lived more than a hundred years before the founding of Stoicism. Essentially, what Heraclitus and Marcus are saying is, the Logos is the natural order of things, and it's always going to get its way. It is, as referenced in a previous episode, the cart that we, the dogs, are tied to. Yet despite being tethered to it, despite it being the thing which determines what will happen and will always get its way, most people don't recognize it and are dragged along in life by force. They never seem to realize or desire to realize the more fulfilling, joyful life they might have if they first realize they were tied to a card 
And second, learn to jog alongside it and be happy doing so, or maybe even lead the way of it if that was possible. It might also be worth noting that in Christian literature, logos was translated as the word. Any religious person or perhaps anyone with even a passing understanding or education in any religious text, that is to say in the Abrahamic religions, will know the term the word. There's an interesting parallel here in that God, as the Abrahamic religions think of him, is nature, as the philosophers and more Western thinkers think of him, or it in their case. It is a force that if we can get in alignment with, a big part of which seems to be accepting that we have a limited amount of control, Christians, for example, will say that's in God's hands. Stoic philosophers would say that is the will of the universe. The major difference being not the outcome, but instead the practices and also the personification of that force. Stoic philosophers did not personify the universe. They suggested by way of suggesting that it had logic built into it, that it might have had a conscious aspect to it, but they never gave it a face or a name or anything that, for example, all of Christendom did. But ultimately, there's a strong similarity here. Christians give things over to God. Stoic philosophers give things over to, hey, whatever is going to be has to be, because that is the natural way. So don't fight it. Which is, at least in my opinion, and I hope this doesn't offend anyone, that's not my intent, is in line with Greek philosophy's more logical take on things. Whereas, and again, no insults here, I'm not judging, the Christian way of interpreting basically the same thing has a lot more mythology and story built into it, right? There are stories, there are characters, and in that way, the Abrahamic religion's take on this very, very similar concept is much more like a traditional polytheistic pantheon, except it's a monotheistic non-pantheon because, well, in Christianity, in the Abrahamic religions, there's only one God. Now, that might be a little bit off the beaten path, just some thoughts I had as I'm speaking here this morning. But for those of you who might be atheists, as I am, and I've mentioned this before, what I have found that Stoicism has done for me as an atheist is to soften me up to what people who believe differently than I do are finding their justifications in. And they're not that different, frankly. I'm very aligned with traditional Stoicism, except I don't believe in, you know, the conscious logic built in nature of the universe. But aside from that, aside from the cosmology of Stoicism, I'm a Stoic. I am a practicing Stoic. I mean, here I am with this podcast. I wouldn't be able to speak on it if I wasn't a practicing Stoic. But when you compare the differences between traditional Western religions, Christianity, for example, or any of those Abrahamic ones, or or really any of them, you don't see, once you get really deep into it, too much difference in what the primary purpose is. To accept that there are things you can't control, to make peace with the fact that there are things you cannot control, and to try to be a good person. And as an atheist, that has really warmed me up to, quote-unquote, the other side. And I think that's been to my benefit, ultimately. But again, just some random thoughts I'm having this morning. Hope I'm not ruffling any feathers. Let's get back to talking about this meditation. It's very difficult not to feel this stinging bit of judgment in this particular meditation, especially in the first and last parts. There's an air of arrogance about it, maybe, as well. And, you know, Marcus was, stoic or not, an emperor. And that can't leave anyone completely unaffected by status. As an emperor, there are some things that you might make assumptions about that, you know, are just not reality for most other people. And so some arrogance on Marcus's part is understandable. Still, that notwithstanding and not making excuses for it, I believe Marcus to have been a far better kind of leader than most of today's leaders. And a much deeper thinker, too. Thank you for listening to this episode of Practical Stoicism. I'm always grateful that you spend some of your week with me, learning and thinking. We need more of that sort of thing these days, and I hope you agree. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, take care.